Okay, folks, we're going to get started now. Um, good afternoon. This is Mike Roller. I'm an archaeologist here in the National Park Service Archaeology Program in the Washington Administrative Support Office, reporting on a rainy day, second day of spring here in D.C. Um, cherry blossom buds and tourists are growing here on the National Capitol, as happens every year. Um, I have the delightful task of organizing the Archaeo Thursday webinar series. Uh, really excited about this presentation today. Um, this this season has been kind of a stop-start affair. Um, details and uh, shutdowns and possible shutdowns looming and stuff. So I think we rescheduled this talk maybe two or three times already. So I really have to thank my uh, presenters for all their patience in uh, sticking with this. So. Um, Today's presentations are from the 2018 John L. Cotter Award winners for Best Project. Uh, generally, we start try to start our season uh, with the Cotter Award winners, um, but uh, because of various interruptions, that didn't happen. So a bit of background about the award. John L. Cotter, uh, 1911 to 1999, was an archaeologist best known for his work in Jamestown, Virginia, and his contributions to the development of historical archaeology. Carter's first National Park Service assignment was at Tuzigut National Monument in Arizona, who went on to be the Northeast Regional Archaeologist between 1957 and 1977. The award was created to recognize professional achievements and exceptional projects in the National Park Service in honor of Dr. Carter's long and distinguished career. The, uh, I just want to mention that the Professional Achievement Award this year went out to uh, recently retired NPS archaeologist Jim Bradford for his long distinguished career. And unfortunately, um, Jim is not able to present a webinar for us this year, but um, hopefully he'll present next fall. So today we have in fact four speakers representing three of the Urban Archaeology Corps projects that went on last summer. And uh, to start, we'll have my colleague, Teresa Moyer, uh, who works also in the NPS Wasso Archaeology Program Office in Cultural Resources, Partnerships and Science. She's going to give a program overview of the Urban Archaeology Corps. Uh, we'll then have presentations from Kate Birmingham, who's currently at the Grand Tetons National Park, but formerly at NACE. Uh, Thedra Stanton, archaeologist in the Southeast Archaeological Center. And Ethan Bullard uh, at Richmond National Battlefield Park, but currently detailed in Alaska. Just a bit of administrative stuff. The webinars will be recorded and put on the NPS Common Learning Portal. Uh, we're going to get them captioned in 508 compliant, but if you're interested in having one sooner than later, just uh, contact me by, be, by email. We're going to have four short presentations and then some time for questions and discussion. Um, and just in the interest of time, please hold your questions until the end. Or um, I, I don't seem to be seeing my chat function right now. Um, if you do, give, it, give, it, give me a, a chat and we'll see if it pops up. Uh, but um, just remember to engage your mics on your phone. Um, if you're not uh, asking a question, please make sure that you mute your phones so we don't hear background noise. So, And then just a quick announcement. In two weeks, April 4th, 2019, at 3 p.m., we'll have our next webinar. The title is uh, Disaster Archaeology, National Park Service Response in the Wake of Hurricanes Irma and Maria by uh, Joshua Murano from Biscayne National Park. Okay, and now I'm going to turn things over to uh, Teresa Moyer. Let me set up her PowerPoint. Okay, thanks, Teresa. Go ahead. Thanks. Do I just hit the arrow keys to go back and forth? Yeah, just hit the left and right. It should work. All right, great. Um, so thank you to the John Cotter Award Committee for awarding the Urban Archaeology Corps team the 2018 award. And many thanks to Mike Roller for setting up and resetting up and resetting up this webinar. Um, and also to the UAC presenters for taking the time to be with us today. The Urban Archaeology Corps, or UAC, was a national program that employed youth to conduct interdisciplinary public archaeology projects in urban national parks. It aimed to use archaeology as a vehicle for civic engagement to increase the stewardship that youth participants felt for national parks and their surrounding communities, as well as to increase the visibility of archaeology and the National Park Service as career options for our diverse constituency. It's not forwarding. Uh, let's see. Mike? Yeah. Yeah, let me see just a second. 
Um, Could I just tell you next slide? Sure. Next slide, please. Okay. There we go. There we go. All right, so I coordinated the UAC from the NPS Archaeology Program at WASO through funding from the NPS Youth Programs Division and the Associate Director for Cultural Resources. Uh, some UAC projects got a financial boost from the National Park Foundation or from their parks friends groups. UAC Parks partnered with youth serving community based nonprofit organizations. In 2012, the UAC piloted at National Capital Park East, or NACE, through a partnership with Groundwork Anacostia River DC. And here you can see our first UAC team. In 2015, the UAC program expanded to include Chickamauga and Chattanooga National Military Park, or CHICCHAT, with the Southeast Conservation Corps. Maggie L. Walker National Historic Site and Richmond National Battlefield Park with Groundwork Richmond VA, and Santa Monica Mountains, or SAMO, with Mountain Recreation Conservation Authority. Working with nonprofit youth serving partners was essential to the UAC model, and each park project was designed to meet the resource management goals of the NPS and the youth support goals of the project partner. These partnerships provided capacity that the Park Service didn't have on its own. Some of this capacity was administrative because the partners had the capacity to recruit, use, and administer their paychecks when the Park Service couldn't. But some of this capacity involved the partner's ability to mentor and track the youth to ensure that they felt supported and had opportunities for growth during and after their UAC project. These partners also administered three-part surveys on the behalf of the Park Service about the UAC, which helped the NPS and our partners to make adjustments as the project went on and that helped the NPS to track changes in attitudes, knowledge, and intentions from the start to the beginning of the project. Go ahead the next slide, please. Thank you. Each park UAC team leads identified small interdisciplinary section 106 and section 110 archeological projects to fulfill needs for resource management and public education. Each UAC team, in addition to the UAC park team lead, included what we call the project archeologist and a youth mentor and five to eight participants. And by youth, I mean high school and college age. If possible, participants from previous years joined UAC teams in subsequent years, sometimes taking on roles with more responsibility. The project archaeologist was typically a graduate student who met the secretary standards and was supervised by park staff. Each project was based in a park and emphasized interdisciplinary perspectives by using multiple lines of evidence in the research. And the participants, most of whom had never done archaeology before, carried out archival and historical research, surveys or field excavation, documentation paperwork, and artifact processing. UAC teams also worked with other park divisions, such as maintenance or natural resources, to learn about the range of park service careers and their connections with archaeology. Each UAC carried out scientific work according to the need of the project, and one aim of the UAC was to teach the participants how to apply the scientific method to archaeology and how to think strategically about solving park problems. Students learned and practiced crafting a research question, techniques for investigating historical sources and archaeological sites, evaluating the data revealed on site against the research question, and making conclusions. Projects in the field were small scale, consisting of shovel test pits or limited excavations. And the, and the projects did not actually even have to have excavations if it wasn't appropriate to the park at that time. Subject matter experts, whether from the park service or external partners slash agencies, taught the participants about soil science, GIS and GPS technologies, and artifact curation. The participants would also visit libraries, archives, and museums to learn the historical context for their archaeological projects. Artifacts were cataloged and curated um, as per 36 CFR 79. Um, artifact archaeologists identified the parameters for artifact collection. Some projects, such as Maggie Walker at Fort Richmond and at NACE, took place in urban context with significant disturbance where the recovered material typically dated to the past 30 years. Other projects, such as Chick Chat and SAMO, were conducted outside the urban center. The Chick Chat project, and I'm looking at Sage right here in case I'm lying, have not recovered a single artifact for curation, two artifacts for curation. Um, artifacts from SAMO, however, revealed important information about prehistoric and historic trade, foodways, and occupation of the Chumash. 
Uh, next slide, please. The UAC projects were in the Park Section 106 pipelines and were part of their ongoing consultation with their state historic preservation officers. Two parks incorporated tribal consultation. Chick Chat consulted with tribes as part of its general management plan process, which included planning for Moccasin Bend, where the UAC took place. A Native American site monitor joined the SAMO UAC to observe the Chumash site excavation. When possible, members of descendant communities met with the team to talk about their life stories and their people's history. Next slide, please. Um, and here we have Richmond uh, meeting with uh, the Gravel Hill community. Another way that the UAC program relied on its partners was their ability to build bridges between the park and its communities in support of historical research and public education. The UAC participants learned oral history and interviewing skills in preparation for talking with local community members. For example, at Maggie Walker Richmond, the UAC participants interviewed descendants of the Gravel Hill community, who you can see in this photograph, to learn about post-Civil War African-American life in the area. The Nate UAC students interviewed longtime residents of the neighborhoods surrounding the Fort Circle Park to learn about how they had interacted with the parks over their lifetime. Next slide, please. Um, participants created educational and interpretive products that disseminated the project results. They were encouraged to create projects that followed what they thought was interesting or important about their UAC experience, particularly what they wanted the public to know about the park and its archaeology. They often chose issues such as the impact of the past on life today, the significance of untold stories, and the role of archaeological stewardship in a democracy. Students designed and developed print brochures, learning by doing activities, community days, trail side interpretations, presentations, blog entries, and videos, and many other formats of what they wanted to say. These materials disseminated the results of archaeological work to professionals and communities and expressed the significance of archaeology to the students in their voices. This speaking back component proved to be a crucial and unique contribution because their generational and life perspectives are not something that the NPS can glean on its own. Within parks, Park Service staff, managers, and superintendents, in fact, met often with the students and held listening sessions to get their feedback. Next slide. Each team's UAC program made a meaningful impact on the almost 145 participants from 2012 to 2017. Program evaluations showed strong, positive change in stewardship, the desire to seek NPS or federal employment, and interest in archaeology and history. Many UAC participants returned for multiple years, which we took to be a sign of success in the program. Um, UAC, team, UAC team members have since joined Youth Conservation Corps or other internship programs, or have used the UAC to bridge their academic degrees into jobs in history or rangering. Project archaeologists have found full-time employment. In fact, one, AC, one UAC participant is now an STE archaeologist with the National Park Service and is in the process of creating a UAC at her park. Uh, slide, please. What was powerful about the UAC was understanding that the National Park Service has needs, its resources have needs, and that everything we do must carry out the NPS mission but that this program was even more so about giving the participants options for the future. For some participants, they got a paid job that kept them in line when they needed to be. For others, the UAC gave them a track that was different from the, ones, from the one their parents insisted was the only one. And for others, the UAC helped to clarify what they wanted to do or what they were good at. And the NPS too learned from our partners and the participants. We got a better handle on the limits and possibilities of archaeological research projects like this. We gained a better understanding of the challenges faced by kids today and by their parents. And we honed a sense of the potential for archaeology to do good. Slide, please. The UAC team leads who you're about to hear from are, are outstanding archaeologists and resource managers. And through their UAC projects, they made major impacts on the UAC participants and contributed significantly to rethinking public outreach and education through NPS archaeology. All balanced their already incredibly busy time to take on this program and have justified the benefits of conducting compliance work through the UAC rather than contracting as an educational opportunity. Due to their extraordinary dedication, they deserve this prestigious award. Slide, please. Thank you. <laughs> 
Thanks, Teresa. Great. Kate, if it's easier, I can just uh, switch the slides for you. Yeah, that'd be great. Okay, great. Cool. Well, awesome. Thank, Thank you, you so much, Mike. And you made me totally jealous when you talked about budding cherry blossoms <laughs> when you started, because I don't know if you guys, all of you on the phone know, but uh, here in Jackson Hole, Wyoming, we got like 70 billion feet of snow this winter, um, so <laughs> all in February. So it's a... Uh, Definitely, definitely a change for me from D.C., but it's, it is also awesome. We just but got slush and so much. sleet here. Sorry? So we just got sleet and slush here pretty much all winter, so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, it's, uh, we win the pretty award, I guess. <laughs> it's very beautiful. So, <laughs> But, yeah, thanks so much, Mike, for, yeah, as Teresa said, scheduling and rescheduling. Um, I'm really happy to participate in this, and I'm I'm really thankful for the Cotter Award Committee for bestowing the award to all of us. Um, and you know, Teresa thanked all of us, but I think it's very important to state that without Teresa Moyer, I mean, this program wouldn't exist, and she's um, sort of been the force behind it and really deserves this. So um, just wanted to make sure that was very <laughs> clear that she kept all of this going for us and. Uh, I think for us, the UAC has been a true labor of love. Um, I think for me, one of the things when I started working in archaeology was def and, and in museums, the museum field, is that there was a disparity between, I think, some people, particularly first-generation um, college students, um, with you know a lot of parents saying, you should really go into a field that you know will make you money. Um, and so this was an opportunity to sort of get interested students a job learning about all of these different career fields and learning about stewardship in a way in which I haven't necessarily uh, seen before um, revolving around archaeology, particularly for students who, who don't have field school experience and, and who are really sort of dipping their toe in. Um, so for me, that's one of the many reasons why it's important. Um, but so National Capital Parks East, or um, NACE, is a wonderfully confusing administrative grouping of about 16 national parks in Washington, D.C. and Maryland. And it constitutes a trove of what I think are absolutely incredible resources. And so I was the Cultural Resources Program Manager there for six years. And when I arrived, I picked up the care of the pilot UAC program. And over my time there, we really honed in on a lot of the key aspects of the program and what worked best for, best for us and what was of most value to the students. Um, slide, please. And the way that we staffed the program changed a bit over the years. We did some of the trial and error, I think, before the 2015 um, national launch. Um, and in some years, all of the hiring was conducted by um, Groundworks Anacostia River DC, our partner. Um, during others, we did add YCC students, and that changed um, over the years. Um, but the age of student varied from 15 to 25, which created really interesting dynamics sometimes. Um, every year, uh, our partner hired a project archaeologist in consultation with us um, who worked with the groups on a day-to-day -day basis. And at NACE, over the six years of the program, we had three incredible women who served in that role. Um, Dr. Mary Furlong Minkoff, Dr. Beth Pruitt, and Chrissy Ames. And none of this could have happened without any of them. Um, and, and they're just really awesome. And we, of course, also had our um, youth mentors. Um, and Teresa mentioned um, Alexis Morris, um, who is starting her own UAC. And without her, you know, I don't know where we'd be. Um, slide, please. So our general goals for the program um, were to increase the diverse dialogue in archaeology, um, expose our students and staff to new perspectives and, perspectives and skills, of course to meet the requirements of the National Historic Preservation Act, um, to provide meaningful employment to youth, um, and also to focus our time and energy on enhancing relationships with local communities. And my major hope, personally, every year was to inspire at least some sort of interest in history in our parks and to mentor participants. And 
what I, you know, upon some reflection, what I gained every year was um, the way in which all of our individual perspectives and our interactions with one another changed how we viewed our parks. Next slide. Um, educational opportunities were probably the central component of the UAC, and we worked with a lot of professionals in the NPS and within the larger DC community. Um, we did things like GIS and GPS workshops. We taught surveying and excavation methods. We would go on tours of museum storage facilities and museums, um, go on park tours with um, all different rangers and historians. Um, I particularly liked to have different individuals give tours of the same place. Um, so I would have them go on a tour with a park ranger of the Frederick Douglass House, um, the curator for the Frederick Douglass House, um, and some other individuals so that they could get different perspectives of history as told by different individuals, particularly when they were working on projects at those particular sites. Um, and that generally uh, was pretty interesting. Um, and we also uh, spent a lot of time teaching participants how to conduct primary document research. Um, we were pretty lucky in that we were really close to the National Archives and Library of Congress. And so, you know, we would, um, some of it uh, required teaching students how to, you know, get a form of ID so that they can get a researcher card. Um, they learned how to use microfiche. Uh, they learned how to patiently wait for document requests to come back, you know, the key things in primary document research. Um, and particularly, um, they learned how to read cursive because um, many of them um, didn't necessarily learn how to do that anymore in school. So that was interesting. Um, and it was always really surprising to us that participants of the program really, really loved the research part. And they found that their interaction with those handwritten documents allowed them to feel directly connected with the original authors. And that often inspired um, a lot of them through the summer, which was really exciting. Um, we also took participants on a lot of field trips, both within and outside of the National Capital Region. Um, the last couple of UAC groups actually um, came out here to Grand Teton National Park, where I am now. Um, and these were some really important and formative experiences for a lot of them. Um, many of our students um, had never left the D.C. area, um, and so it was really exciting to, to teach them how to camp and to do all of that type of work. Uh, slide. So, of course, I had to put the exclamation points with Section 106. Of course, I'm very excited about it. But the participants were excited to get to the field work every summer, too. And I loved having the help with our 106 and 110 backlog. But UAC projects over the years helped us to document um, an ARPA violation at Fort Mahan Park. We um, surveyed trail improvement sites at the Civil War Defenses of Washington. We surveyed a portion of Oxen Hill Farm prior to a silo preservation project. Um, we prepared for a road project adjacent to the Fort DuPont Earthworks. And then during our last couple of years of the UAC, we surveyed portions of the Frederick Douglass House National Historic Site. And generally, the feelings with the students about field work always varied, but um, my very unscientific analysis indicates that the unhappiest groups were working in full sun during uh, August in D.C., so I cannot blame any of them for that. <laughs> but we also tried to work with um, archaeologists at fellow parks in the region um, to provide assistance for small projects, because um, I really liked getting the students out to different places in the region. So we worked at Rock Creek Park, um, the George Washington Memorial Parkway, and Monocacy National Battlefield over the years. And the participants in particular, um, even on our small 106 projects, I tried to invite um, WASO archaeologists, MPS archaeologists um, from all over to come dig with us and provide mentorship to the students. Um, and they really loved talking to everyone. Um, the students loved hearing the experiences and perspectives um, of all of us. So I'm very grateful that we had that level of participation from everyone. Slide. And lab work, of course, was a huge component of our educational process. Um, before field work every year, um, we would meet um, at the Museum Resource Center, which is the storage facility for the National Capital Region, and 
um, the regional archaeology program archaeologists, particularly uh, Marianne Krebling and Karen Orrance, would always give this huge tour to everyone, um, talk with everyone, particularly about the identification of prehistoric materials, since it was a little harder um, to conceptualize for the students, um, to talk about collections care and object processing. Um, and I also have to thank Marion and Karen who, you know, they put their all into everything, but they also had to take some of my loose ends as I relocated here. So I appreciate that and need that on record. But um, it was always really important. I think the students really got a concept of the fact of the longevity of what they were doing, that it wasn't just something that they were doing for a summer and then it went away, that there was actually a lot of time and work and effort that went into all of our work um, and future research potential. I think that was very interesting to them. Next slide, please. So our goal is always to have some sort of interpretive product as the result of our um, UAC efforts. Um, in some years, they produced videos. Um, and there's an image here of a video that was actually used for a very large ethnographic project. And this video was produced by um, one, of our, one of our students who then went on to, to work for the MPS for a time. Um, and the videos ended up, we, we sort of phased out of those a little bit just because it took half the summer to teach them how to, how to create the videos, which was a useful skill, um, but then we, we sort of refocused that a little bit over time. Um, but then we, we sort of looked more at blog posts, um, using Instagram and, and tags to sort of reach a, a different audience, um, and a lot of the audience of the peers of the students, um, so that they could sort of live vicariously um, through what they were doing. Um, next slide. The biggest impact of our work always came from community engagement efforts. Um, and these were included community days, um, participation in the DC Day of Archaeology, um, general public ar archaeology outreach as we were doing projects, um, and work with the Office of the DC Archaeologist. And we did want to instill the importance of consultation in archaeological stewardship and how important that was and sharing data and how to successfully share data. Um, and one thing I'll point out is there's, a, there's an image at the top center um, of one of our participants who was an education student in college and um, he did his own version of the cookie excavation, which was like the most popular activity at the DC Day of Archaeology that year. Um, and it was very well talked about. And, um, they just got so excited about it, and it was really, really fun working with them and seeing um, their ideas about how we could engage better um, with students rather than doing some of the same things that we'd been sort of recycling over a number of years. Uh, next slide. And there are a ton of important themes and stories I could tell about the UAC. Um, my favorite times with the groups were when we were able to have very deep and meaningful discussions about how we interpret history, where our data comes from, and why our diverse narratives um, and the storytellers that deliver those narr narratives are so important for our profession. Um, and everyone, every participant taught me and continues to teach me throughout my own career. And I'm incredibly grateful for the opportunity to have those relationships and to continue talking with these students. And I know I didn't go explicitly into a lot of project archaeology here, but I felt like the full breadth of what we covered over the years, um, you know, deserved, deserved some attention. But um, during Q&A, if you guys have specifics, you can let me know. But thank you. Thanks, Kate. And on to um, Ethan. Um, Ethan, I'll just uh, change the slides for you if that's all right. Are you out there? Sorry, yep, here I am. Uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, yeah, that's great. Uh-oh, uh is that slide? I'm only seeing half the slide. I don't know if you've uh, got the full, uh, let's full image there. Um, how was that? No. I just see a big white space with, uh, I saw all of Kate's slides just fine. You can scroll down to it, Mike. Oh, you know what? Um, yeah, PDFs 
sometimes do this. I think on each individual computer you may um, be able to slide up and down, scroll up and down. Um, oh, okay, there you go. Can you do that? Okay, all right. Yeah, that's Apologize. fine. Apologize. Um, well, thank you, folks. Uh, yeah, my name is Ethan Bullard, and I'm the museum curator at Richmond National Battlefield Park and the Maggie Walker National Historic Site. Uh, but like Mike said, I'm, I'm on detail. I'm up in uh, Glacier Bay National Park and Preserve in southeast Alaska. A lot different than, than back home. Um, but yeah, myself, along with our uh, chief of resources, Kristen Allen, we were the two that, that managed um, the Urban Archaeology Corps program for our two parks from 2015 to 2018. And I want to echo uh, Kate's point that we really owe um, Teresa a huge round of applause and a huge thanks um, for spearheading this and championing this uh, throughout all its years. And, you know, I personally am really honored to, to be a part of this program and, and to receive this award. Um, so, you know, we have a variety of sites uh, between these two parks. We're, we're, we're co-managed, um, same administration, a lot of uh, crossover with the same interp between the two parks. And even though we, we tell a real broad span of history um, that uh, we recognize this, the, the, con the concept of UAC would really lend itself well to discovering the, the city's deep, rich African-American history um, as it's manifested in, in both of our parks. Um, for those of you that don't know, Richmond is a medium-sized city with around 220,000 residents and a, and a pretty large, sprawling metro area. And as a historic city, it's most well known as the capital of the Confederacy and, and of course, the state capital. Um, but it has a real compelling history of Native American. Um, Native American history was once the, the, the seat of, of government for the Powhatan Nation. Um, it was the largest market for interstate slave trading, and it was also, after the Civil War, considered the birthplace of black capitalism, which led to a, a healthy black middle class population in the early 20th century. And so, you know, these stories aren't always well known and well publicized, especially to high school students. And so a major goal for us for all three years was to empower young minority voice, voices of today by, by investigating powerful minority stories from the past. And this was a, just a perfect lens for, for, for uncovering that. Uh, next slide, please, Mike. Um, oops. Yeah, so, um, you know, the, our two parks are, are, again, kind of sprawling. So we've got three urban sites downtown, um, including the Maggie Walker National Historic Site. That's a, a furnished house museum, uh, the home of Maggie Lena Walker, the nation's first African-American female bank president. And then we have two Civil War museums downtown, and then another 11 Civil War battle sites um, scattered in the counties to the south and east and the northeast of, of the city of Richmond. Um, and so we, we got time to explore, um, you know, all of these places uh, between the three years of, of this program. And our partner, um, as Teresa mentioned, was Groundwork RVA, uh, a nonprofit, you know, sort of the, the, the Richmond branch of the National Groundwork um, Organization. And they had a proven track record of working with the Richmond public school system through their green teams. And these were uh, groups of high schoolers that learned outdoor sciences while contributing to trail construction and um, other outdoor park infrastructure and maintenance. And so because they had a rapport with the schools and with these green, green team students, Groundwork selected the high schoolers and jointly the NPS and Groundwork selected the project archeologist. Uh, you know, and I should mention that Richmond and Maggie Walker do not have a staff archeologist. Um, so most of our excavations were done, um, or traditionally done through, through contract, um, or occasionally with regional assistance and with borrowed help from other parks. Um, but we do not have a, a staff archeologist. And so that was, um, you know, an important, uh, important thing to consider throughout, throughout our, our uh, term with this program. Um, so I wanted to do just kind of a, a play by play of our three, uh, our three summers and actually our, our first uh, foray, which is the pilot week. Uh, so if you'll start with the, the next slide, Mike. Mm -hmm. um, basically, you know, we got, uh, we, we had heard of the success, of course, of, of UAC up in Anacostia um, at the National Capital Parks East. And Teresa called us. I don't really recall how it all began, but we got the, the, the notion that we were going to attempt to do it in Richmond for the summer 
of 2015, but, the, but first we wanted to test it out in a pilot program. So we did a one-week program during spring break of 2015 uh, with the theme became Maggie Walker's Richmond. And, you know, this, um, we knew that obviously in, a, in one week, limited time, limited funds, this was not about, this was not going to be an excavation-driven project. Um, and so we, we knew right away, okay, well, we can use, of course, the, the, some of the disciplines of archaeology, mapping and primary and secondary source research, uh, oral history, and, and of course interpretation, uh, use all of these tools as a window into discovering more about Maggie Walker and her influence on Richmond. Um, because the thing is, you know, the Park Service maintains Maggie Walker's home. Um, this is where she lived as an adult. Um, you can see a photo over there, you know, for those of you that don't know, she created a bank in 1903 making her the nation's first African-American female bank president. She also ran an African-American newspaper and a department store and um, led a large fraternal organization called the Independent Order of St. Luke. Uh, so she had a, uh, quite a big footprint in Richmond and uh, in black America at large, but the park's only resource is her home where she lived for the last 30 years of her adult life. Uh, you know, it's an urban setting, obviously, and. Uh, it's a great place to interpret her, her life, uh, or at least her domestic life, her personal life, but not as much to, to reach out and see some of her other uh, manifestations in the community. And so what we want to do is, you know, explore her Richmond, see these other sites that are not managed by us. So that includes her birthplace and her burial site, her businesses, her offices, uh, her church and her school. Um, and so, you know, a lot of these are either privately owned or they're owned by some other entity. They're not well interpreted. Um, if you'll go to the next slide, you'll see, um, for instance, this is Maggie Walker's Emporium. This was a general store that Mrs. Walker ran, um, you know, staffed primarily by African-American women uh, from 1905 to 1911, and it is uh, shuttered now and, and boarded up, and there's no interpretation on it whatsoever. Uh, so it really, unfortunately, kind of locks in its, its rather compelling history, um, and, and folks just don't know about it. And so it's great, of course, to bring our students by, and they could they could see these sites, and, and like I mentioned, these other sites. Um, that you know, we start to develop this this theme that this, these are hidden in plain sight. You know, this is just this vibrant history that students have gone past a zillion times and had no, no idea. Um, and so to, to reveal these and start to share them with the community, we created um, a brochure. It was done in a zine format, which was, uh, you know, kind of a, kind of had like a scrapbook type of feel to it, but it was following an overall narrative, including, uh, you know, maps and a timeline and a self-guided tour. Uh, and then first-person language that the students wrote uh, for them to express their, their personal interest in the various Walker-related locations that I mentioned. So uh, if you'll go to the next slide, you'll see what we did. Uh, here's our group of students from the pilot week, um, uh, along, by the way, with their um, project archaeologist, Courtney Bowles. And so um, what we did was we created that zine. The students created that zine. The Park Service uh, printed copies and stocked it in our um, visitor center at Maggie Walker, but then also uh, created, the students created this cool little newspaper box that they painted and stenciled and got permission from the city to place it right in front of the, the St. Luke Emporium, uh, which is right next door or, or right down the street from one of Walker's bank locations. And so this was a way to just to do exactly what had been missing, is to provide some, some free interpretation on these, these sites. Um, so huge success, we thought, for that, that first week pilot program. Definitely wanted to, to pursue it in the summer. So next slide. Um, you'll see what we did for the full, their first full summer program uh, was something actually quite, quite different. We, we were still based in Maggie Walker. That became our classroom space. Uh, but every day we took field trips about almost a half an hour away uh, to the south and east of the city to a new parcel of land that the park had acquired at um, um, place called, well, the Glendale Battlefield, uh, part of the 1862 campaigns around Richmond. But this parcel uh, sits in uh, an area known as the Gravel Hill community, and particularly it was the property of a family, uh, the Sykes family. And so interesting little story here is that in the late 1700s, uh, a farming family, a, a plantation family, the Pleasants, 
uh, manumitted all of their slaves. There's, they, I forget the total amount of, of enslaved people that they owned, but uh, in their will, uh, the, the, the planter, you know, gave, gave them their freedom. And so a lot of these uh, formerly enslaved people and their descendants remained on the property, um, you know, as, as farmers, as free farmers during the slavery era. So a bit of an anomaly, something you don't really get to discover much of. And certainly something that was eye-opening to these students who are really mostly taught, okay, you know, before 1865 to be black was to be enslaved. And here we have, you know, more than half a century um, of, you know, black autonomy and, and um, a little bit of independence uh, really out in rural Virginia. Um, but like I said, the park acquired a parcel of land because it's key to our Glendale battlefield, and we wanted to identify the foundation, or at least um, we knew there was a sort of a modern foundation from, from, the, from the Sykes' uh, descendants, but we wanted to, to better pinpoint the, um, um, you know, an original foundation from one of the homes there. And so, um, next slide. Uh, I should mention that our project archaeologist, Courtney, she... Uh, was fantastic, was an amazing creative thinker. She was working on her degree and did, was not, did not meet, meet Secretary of, of uh, Interior Standards. So we did have to bring in a hired gun to help us with the excavation. And for that, we had uh, the excellent help of Eric Kreutsch, who was the North, at that time, the Northeast Region anthropologist. Um, and so that's him in the, in the center there in that slide. And during the excavation, you know, Eric, one of his best contributions that summer and something that then stuck with us for a while was the, the insistence on having, having these, these excavations open to the public. And so he, we created a, a public archaeology day um, sort of midway through the program where the Gravel Hill residents, the, you know, the folks that are still in that community today that have descended from those original uh, Pleasants and Sykes uh, folks that, that have worked that land for centuries, um, they're still around, but we also invited um, the press and educators and park staff and family members and other museum staff from the area, and it was an opportunity for them to see what we were doing, for the students to tell, to, 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 to you know, explain what they were doing, and that was, that was hugely successful. Um, and so, you know, we continued the excavation, um, and by the end of the summer, if you'll go to the next slide, we then hosted a, another type of community day, and there you're, you're already familiar with that photo on the left. Um, as Teresa had mentioned earlier, you know these uh, descendants of Gravel Hill, many of whom have have lived on the same parcel of land for for several centuries. You know they have family reunions there. So we fortunately were able to coordinate this with one of these family reunions. Some of their some of their family live overseas, and so it was really, really uh, powerful. We, we basically used their community center there, which is an old um, Jim Crow era Rosenwald uh, school. I wish I had a photo of that here. Unfortunately, I don't. Um, but you know, it was a catered event. The students prepared presentations, a short video, um, little posters throughout the room, and even um, at this, an artifact display case with some of the material that that we found um, in during the excavation. Uh, but that was that was really cool, um, huge success. Uh, you know, it, it was a, a way for us to not just show off what, what we and Groundwork had been doing, but really to inspire the Gravel Hill descendants with a, a renewed sense of pride in their own unique story. And that that was that was really moving, especially for you know the older generation there that that were aware that younger folks are moving away and getting less interested in personal history. And so to have this new class of students that weren't even related to these people to be impassioned, you know, it was, it was just really moving. Um, so uh, the next uh, summer, if you'll go to the next slide there, yep, uh, we returned downtown to a different unit of the Richmond National Battlefield Park, and this was focused at Chimborazo. So Chimborazo is uh, our headquarters. You can see that the building in the back there, which is a 1909 Weather Bureau building. Um, but during the Civil War, it was the largest Confederate hospital. Not that building, of course, but actually about 150 wooden buildings um, spanning this giant plateau on what was then the eastern edge of, of downtown Richmond. And, um, you know, that's the, that's the story that most people know about Chimborazo, a oh, big old Confederate hospital. But it had a, a history uh, about three times as long as it, as it had as a, as a hospital for being a 
um, Freedmen's Camp, essentially. So initially, right after the, the end of the Civil War, the Freedmen's Bureau, you know, a federal agency, was, um, you know, operating that as a, as a refugee camp, offering formal education and housing and food rations and medical aid to uh, recently liberated enslaved people from, from the area. Uh, when, when Reconstruction ended and, and the federal government pulled out, um, that area remained uh, as sort of a self-governed um, community uh, that never had an official name or anything like that. But, um, you know, it had, it had quite an interesting history where the, some of the, the folks that were living there, had, you know, dismantled old boards from the hospital buildings to create their own buildings, their own dwellings. And, um, you know, in, in really this, this murky area of, of post-Civil War post-reconstruction life, they had had a community with some level of protection, although there was also a lot of, of violence and attempts from white Richmonders to kick them out. Um, so it, it was something that, that I learned a lot about just in, in discovering this and, and, you know, the students, it was just, again, just totally eye-opening for them. Um, you know, uh, let's see, if you go to the next slide, uh, you know, during the excavation, what we were hoping to find out uh, was again, you know, something similar to what we've done the previous summer to, to identify, uh, a, you know, a footprint, a post hole, something to give us an indication of where one of the original buildings from the hospital uh, would have existed that we could then um, align with one of the historic maps. The problem was is that there'd been so much um, early 20th century landscaping and grading, earth moving, because what had happened uh, and, and ultimately what had kicked out the, the freemen that, that had settled there was when the city annexed that land and they created a, a city park around it. And so they evicted uh, the black population that was there and then they sculpted the ground and made these rolling hills. So there was so much new fill that we recognized we would have needed a, um, like an excavator to dig much, much deeper. So most of what the students ended up uh, discovering was, was early 20th century building material um, as the neighborhood expanded around it. You can see in the background there in the upper right, you know, some of these late 19th century row houses and such. Um, although they did find a, like a, a large cache of, of animal bones that, that we never did get dated, but looked uh, like crudely cut, crudely butchered. Um, uh, deer, possibly some cow bones, found some teeth, things like that that um, uh, are still being curated now or cataloged now, but are, um, you know, p potential indications of some of the, the self-sufficiency during that, that post-reconstruction uh, era. Um, just like with the summer before, we, we, we did another public archaeology day. If you go to the next slide, um, this was another excellent opportunity, you know, inviting the press out and neighborhood um, residents and, and, you know, again, families and, and uh, park staff and everybody. Uh, unfortunately, the thing that was missing this year that we, that we found was that we didn't have that intrinsic stakeholder community like we had with Gravel Hill. Like nobody in this neighborhood, Chimborazo, really claimed any sort of ethnographic tie, you know, or uh, any real lineage to the place, even even folks that have been there for years. Um, this was just sort of a novelty, and I know that the students picked up on that, you know, that it, they almost felt like they were just working in someone's, you know, city park, which they were, uh, as opposed to, to, to really a tie to other people's history. Uh, although what was, I think, pretty moving is that they, they were just compelled by the story itself and found, um, you know, found themselves contemplating, you know, their own family histories and bridging that gap of like, wait a minute, what happened after slavery? You know, what was what were some of those next steps and what was some of those those stories that, that we have not yet told? Um, uh, for the next slide, um, you'll see that we did, just like the summer before, you know, hosted a, a um, kind of a culminating event with, with another public component where students gave presentations, created uh, interpretive displays, exhibit cases, and something really, really cool that they did was create, uh, you can see in the upper left photo there, they created that outline posting on, on four corners and, and two sides um, these, these giant uh, wayside markers indicating the, the accurate size of just one of those hospital buildings. And in each of those posts, they created this, you know, this wayside with interpretation on the Freedmen's Camp there. Um, and that's something that is that's missing and still is missing. I mean, it's stayed up for several months, um, but we often we thought of this as a potential blueprint for, for future interpretation there because, again, the main focus all around that, um, that site is the, the Civil War history and the Confederate hospital history. And, you know, um, 
this this is an opportunity, I think, still to, to expand that and get some permanent um, wayside interpretation out there. Um, all right, uh, I'm going to wrap this up pretty quick. Sorry um, if I'm dragging. Yeah, next slide there. So we, in 2017, we returned to this concept of Maggie Walker's Richmond for a whole summer-long program. Uh, it's an entirely different group of students than, than had participated in the pilot week. So it was an opportunity to, you know, to, to revisit for me, but for them it was, it was all new, um, go into greater detail, greater depth, um, do a lot of um, research at the state library, you know, looking, um, learning some new skill sets like genealogical research that the students themselves were able to, to trace, you know, their own families, which was really cool. Um, just like in the pilot week, the students created another brochure, but they, they took it up a notch and that they actually hosted, uh, and this was really fun, a um, trolley tour of Maggie Walker's Richmond. So if you can see there in the back left, there's this, you know, wooden trolley that uh, groundwork rented for the day, and the students had their invitation list of family and teachers and people that uh, that they drove, well, you know, a driver drove them around the city. And so rather than just reading about Maggie Walker's Emporium and her bank and her church, we went to all of these places, and each student took turns, um, you know, performing like a like about a 10-minute prepared piece on on these different locations. And that was really special because even though they've given little brief presentations here, here and there in the past, um, in previous summers they had done that. It almost always, you know, defaulted to like the, the best speaker in the group would always kind of get get most of the attention. Where this, each person was really, uh, you know, kind of thrust into the limelight, and it was an opportunity for them to to practice their their public speaking skills. Um, so that was that was a neat element that you know was never intended as part of the goal, but definitely one of the um, one of the outcomes of this. And something especially interesting is the summer of this program was also the summer that the statue that these students are, are gathered around here uh, was dedicated. It was dedicated in, in July of, of 2017, um, you know, right in the midst of the <clears throat> national discourse on Confederate monuments, the Charlottesville riots. Uh, all of this was happening at the exact same time. And so these students are learning about, you know, about oh, what to do with these Confederate monuments. And meanwhile, the city is also... Um, you know, having this public art process that culminates with the um, installation of, of a bronze monument to Maggie Walker. So that was that was a real uplifting moment for for that summer for those students and, and certainly for myself. Um, and then the final slide. Um, just want to talk a little bit about some of the the takeaways from this this program. Um, you know, I I I evolved throughout the whole thing for sure. Um, you know not just, you know, looking at these old photos where you can chart my hair loss throughout three years, but but just my expectation of the of what this could be. You know, I was started off kind of results driven, thinking like, okay, well what do we what does the park need? What do we need to investigate? Um, whereas I quickly realized um, that these students are bringing something way more valuable than what our park staff can do. I mean, we, we have a lot of the training and the resources, and we can get funds to do, you know, Section 106 compliance. And, you know, we can do what we need. Um, but what these students brought was, you know, a renewed vitality. They brought a unique perspective, and they became ambassadors for, for us, for the stories that we're trying to protect and that we're trying to preserve, and they became youth ambassadors, and it made such a big difference. You know, I, I can imagine that that event for instance, say Gravel Hill, if, if the NPS had tried to, to convey the same stories, that would not have been nearly as, as touching as it was um, to have these young, predominantly African-American high school students telling those stories. And we got great press coverage throughout, as you can see a couple of these clippings here. Um, you know, national NPR picked us up, um, local press, regional press, NPS press. So that was, that was something really, really moving. Um, just to get you know to get our word out there and get the students as our as our ambassadors and you know uh, Kate made a point early on about the exposure for students you know to, to learning these you know potential career options and I, and that was another thing that was really special here is that these students got to meet lots of different NPS and state um, historians and different kinds of professions and every time they got to meet someone new, whether it was a, a law enforcement ranger or an interpreter or a resource manager, that park staff would take um, take a moment to explain their story and like how they got to be in the position that they're in, um, so that 
these students who, you know, many of whom were the, the first to, to, you know, presuming that they were going into college, which a lot of them were. We, they were all high school age, and some of them, you know, were graduating and heading into college and are, are doing well there now. But for a lot of them, again, not knowing what kind of career options were out there and also not knowing that you can take a zillion different directions to end up working for the Park Service. No two stories are the same. And I think that was, that was pretty moving um, uh, and inspirational for those students. Um, so again, you know, thank you guys. Thanks for the, the committee, uh, and thanks Teresa. Um, you know, this again, I, I never set out to do this. This was not a this was not our idea. Like, hey, let's do Urban Archaeology Corps. This just kind of came down to us, and we embraced it, and it became one of the highlights of my career. I'm I'm just really touched to have been a part of it. That's it. Awesome. Thanks, Ethan. Yep. And uh, um, thank your your park for letting you off a little bit of time from your detail to present. <laughs> <laughs> okay, our next presentation is uh, Thedris uh, Stanton from the Southeast Archaeological Center. And I will change the slides. All right, Thedra. Hi. So, um, as you might have noticed with each of these different Urban Archaeology Corps programs, each one is a little bit different, and that uh, uh, the Chickamauga Chattanooga one is, is no less different and unique as well. Um, for uh, this one, is the Ch for Chattanooga, it focused mainly at uh, Moccasin Bend, and um, can you go ahead and forward to the next slide? So Moccasin Bend is uh, part of Chattanooga, and as you can see, it is this bend in the Tennessee River, and which is also, it, which you know, was a major pivotal point for the Civil War. Um, there's huge Civil War earthworks over on the right-hand side that is heavily forested um, of that bend. But as you can see um, now, there is the mental health hospital. There's a golf course up on the upper left, and then over on the right-hand side, there is now a firing range, a weapons firing range there, too. So the park, Moccasin Bend, is, only makes up a small portion of this. And in there, you can see where the little green dot is, the Blue Blazes Trail. Um, so this is a small trail that was there prior to Moccasin Bend actually being incorporated into Chattanooga. And as you can see, Chattanooga kind of surrounds Moccasin Bend, but there's been little, very little development in this area and it's very heavily wooded. So that became the focus of the Urban Archaeology Corps program at Chattanooga. So um, the Southeast Conservation Corps is the partner that, is, that was the local organization that Teresa worked with um, and they recruit, recruited the youth as well as the crew chief that would help out. They would. Um, get the students from the local high schools, um, varying high schools throughout Chattanooga, and then they would meet at one point and get um, shuttles bussed into Moccasin Bend or into larger Chattanooga. And then from chat, the chat staff, Chris Young, he was pretty pivotal in coordinating all of this as well. And so he actually would set it up so that the students would do basically trail crew work Monday through Thursday and then on Friday it was like an educational day and on that Friday they would meet they would get a tour of some of the other parts of the Chattanooga battlefield they'd get a chance to even learn like first aid CPR other safety things as well um, they got to go on a canoeing trip um, on a Friday and then he also coordinated with us and um, with Teresa to bring in Nick Honorkamp from University of Tennessee who had done work there at Moccasin Bend previously and then me and also Satin Bowman who had participated in the Urban Archaeology Corps training. So um, even though Chattanooga doesn't have an archaeologist on staff, we kind of stepped into that role to help out the park participate in this program. And it really ended up being a very interesting experience. I would just come in for about a week with um, either Satin Bowman or another staff member from SEAC and provide like the basic archeological education. So go ahead, next slide, please. So um, instead of doing some of the on the ground kind of work, uh, we would instead did in some in classrooms. So we did presentations, 
we did these little mock um, activities as well to give them an opportunity to see what it was like to actually do some mapping. Um, we did actually uh, take them back out into Moccasin Bend and kind of hike around and show them how they would document site, the paperwork that was involved, how to use GPS units as well. And, um, but it was all pretty much focused on just one week with the rest of the week being mainly for the um, trail maintenance as well. So next slide, please. So we did actually do a few shovel tests um, along. We did, one year we did metal detecting where they were putting in some new signs and that was one that you saw up there at the beginning of the slideshow to replace a couple of signs. And then this is at the very top of Moccasin Bend and you can see part of the old uh, radio tower behind this, um, the one girl on the left-hand side. And it was a radio tower that was built on top of the hill um, in the 1950s, and they basically you brought up a bulldozer using the old Civil War roads, brought it up there, and bulldozed off a star fort that was at the top to build this uh, radio tower, which of course is now starting to, is obsolete. And so they're going to remove that to kind of restore it. Um, the park has, like uh, Teresa mentioned before, has gone through consultations with the, not only with the tribal members, but also the local community to see about opening up Moccasin Bend. The firing range is probably going to be closing soon, and so that'll allow people to be able to safely access this area a little bit better. Um, can I have the next slide, please? And so we were just trying to find some, uh, in the course of doing the trail work that they did for the Blue Blazes Trail, students needed to know a basic understanding of archaeology, what do artifacts look like, what to do when they encountered them. So in the case that they did in um, doing the trail work, which included everything from exotic vegetation removal to building foot bridges to just basic general trail repair, that if they did encounter anything, they would know what to do. And so that was really, um, really helpful because the Blue Blazes Trail had been established prior to the park, um, it was in really bad repair. And as you saw in the map, it is an isolated area that doesn't get a lot of foot traffic to it. And so the Blue Blazes Trail is going to be just one portion of the larger interpretive plan for Moxon Bend. Can I have the next slide, please? And so the students actually had a chance to go up here, and this is at the top of the mountain, and Chris Young is He's uh, over there on the left, and like I said, he was he was the main organizer for the Chattanooga um, Urban Archaeology Corps program, and there I am with the red backpack. And he's explaining the earthworks, and as you can see, it's a heavily wooded area right now, and because of that, it's not um, visited. You have to be guided in by a ranger to access this area. But the cannon emplacements and embattlements are still there. You can still see where the cannons were placed, where there were sleeping pads for the soldiers. You can see the old roads that um, the horses uh, would have drawn up so these weapons and ammunition up to. But it's a very peaceful experience right in the middle of Chattanooga. And so none of these students had ever heard or learned about any of this part. None of them had ever really had this experience. When you're standing up there, you can see the Tennessee River and you can see the entire Chattanooga city as well. It's a beautiful viewpoint. Um, and it, by giving them this opportunity to visit this location with Chris telling the history of the battle and what happened there and then me coming along to talk about how Moccasin was a pivotal point also for Native peoples and talk about archaeology and then also the potential future plans of the park, it really opened up conversations to management planning about how the public has an input into that management plan, how we as park staff make recommendations, um, and then get the feedback from the public, and then what role that they are playing as stewards of this community as well. And so this just added to that whole experience, having this conversation in this beautiful area that for right now, very few people get to access, and yet they were given this insider's tour as well. Um, Chris, of course, he helped facilitate um, tours into other parts of the park as well. Um, when I was there during my week with the students, 
Um, I always try to introduce them to a little less Civil War, a little bit more Native American. And so you saw that one of our pictures that Teresa had up there earlier was actually showing adult adult throwing and spear throwing. And we did other activities with them as well, just to kind of give them an opportunity to have a better understanding of the whole history of the park, not just the Civil War aspect of it, but the fact that Moxton Bend has been such a key location for so long, and a lot of these students just did not know about that. And that was one of the comments that uh, one of the students made, is that in just a couple of weeks he had been there at that point, he would already learned more than he had ever learned in his high school history class about Chattanooga and its history. And so that said a lot um, to me in this program and what it meant to them. So for them, I thought it was a really great opportunity to be allowed um, to go out to this part of the park that isn't commonly visited, um, but yet they drive by it all the time. The freeway goes right around on the other side of the river, and so you can see Moccasin Bend as you're driving by on the freeway, but not a lot of people go out there unless you know, you're going to the golf course. So hopefully in the future, uh, more people will be able to get out there and see this place um, as well. But I know that the students took away from it this uh, experience of seeing how a park uh, begins the development of a new place and then all the parties that are involved because they did actually get to learn about that experience and the role that they could potentially play in the park's future as well. And, um, and so it was, it was a really great opportunity for me to get out there and interact with these students. Like I said, I would only go up there for a one week out of the whole six week program. Um, the park, of course, did most of the brunt of the work, so, um, but I would help out when they were actually doing any excavation, which I said were pretty limited. Um, but they did, for the Blue Blazes Trail, they divided it up into portions. And so each year the students took a new portion and for them to reach that end of their section and to be able to look back down the trail and see the difference between what they had accomplished and what was in what was still left to be done made um, gave them a very clearly defined goal it was something that was very easy for them to walk back along that section of trail that they had worked on and to realize that they had made a positive impact onto this environment and into the park as well. And for them, that was one of the big takeaways was working on these group endeavors, very physical labor. A lot of it was very physical. And, you know, it's in the south here in Chattanooga in the summertime, it's very hot, lots of ticks. <laughs> as you can see how we're all dressed with the pants and everything like that, it was very hot. Um, and ticks are abundant, um, but it was definitely a bonding. We did have a couple of students return year after year as well. So like uh, Teresa said, that was, all, that was like a great hallmark that they had learned from it, they enjoyed it enough that they wanted to come back and experience it. And of course, whenever you bring in new people, it changes the dynamic. But for overall, they still had a very positive experience when they walked away from it. And I think each one of these kids, you know, coming from Chattanooga, learned so much more about the history of their city and why it was there and why it's significant and why the park exists and the, what are the resources out there to be experienced. Um, but yeah, I'd like to, like to thank Teresa again for you know um, putting this all together. It was such a, a wonderful experience for me um, being able to work with the park staff on this endeavor. And I think it was for the students as well. They seem to always enjoy it and just take away take away a lot of experience from this. That's it for me. Thanks, Deidre. Thank you. Thanks, all of you, for those great presentations. So you can definitely see the uh, sort of variation and resourcefulness in uh, the way the uh, UAC um, operates in each of its different contexts and everything. Um, we have a bit of time for a question and answer, and um, I, I just saw that Gary Gary Brown is on from Santa Monica Mountains, I think. Um, Gary wasn't able to join us for the presentation. He's pretty busy. Santa Monica Mountains, as you know, was uh, ravaged by a fire, and uh, he's in overdrive right now. But Gary, do you want to say if, a few words about the the UAC program out there, if you have a moment? Or yeah, I could do that. 
Um, I, I think that um, I certainly, I, I don't need to echo too much of the comments already made, but it was a, a really great program that SAMO was happy to participate in. I think that Teresa Moyer did a fantastic job of putting together the program and providing the oversight uh, for all. And I believe Sadra mentioned the uh, interesting variety in how different parks reached into their uh, resources and came up with something that was uh, interesting and very different in all these cases. I enjoyed hearing the uh, presentations from other parks at SAMO. It was more of a uh, traditional uh, Native American archaeological connection that we pursued and uh, we're happy to uh, include some Native American participants in the program that uh, made it very uh, gratifying but it was uh, also a chance uh, at the local level for the park to uh, really tighten up a, a productive three-way uh, partnership with uh, a local uh, conservancy, the Mountains Recreation Conservation Association, and uh, uh, California State University at Los Angeles, and uh, put together something that worked well in terms of providing opportunities for everyone from uh, high school students to uh, graduate students and um, worked out uh, very well. It was a, uh, somebody had mentioned, definitely it was a, a labor of love that involved a, a lot of work, but the, the payoff was quite huge. We had um, both, uh, we had people who went on and did pursue archaeology in their uh, subsequent education as well as uh, pursue jobs with the Park Service. So I think it um, was a huge success and uh, very much uh, honored uh, to be part of the award and part of this team that has worked with the Urban Archaeology Corps. Great. Thanks. Thanks, Gary. Okay, so... Um, Thank you, Mike. Yeah, yeah, I'm glad you could join us. We've got a few minutes for a uh, question and answer. Um, so the chat function does work if you'd prefer to ask a question by chat for um, the group in general or for a specific uh, per speaker. Um, if you just uh, hold your mouse next to my to the right of um, my host name and the participants, you'll see a little chat bubble. Otherwise, um, just go ahead and ask questions. Um, oh, we got a question already. Uh, from Turk. When I first started the NPS, oh wait, just a minute, my chat disappeared. When I first started the NPS a few years ago, I was told that non-professional archaeologists were not allowed to do any digging. Obviously, from these UAC projects, that is not the case. Are there any official guidelines available on using volunteers for archaeology? Oh, interesting. Can anyone address that? This is Kate Birmingham, and I don't know about official guidelines, but in terms of what I'm familiar with, it's mainly that you need to have an archaeologist who meets the secretary's standards who is leading an excavation. In terms of their team, I think that team can be made up of whoever, but, but the report write-ups, the actual um, methodology and planning all has to just be done by a professional archaeologist, as far as I'm aware. Okay. Any other questions? Um, I've got a quick question uh, for all of you. For, for parks or regions that are interested in starting a, a UAC program, what kind of considerations do you think they should be taken to, into account um, beforehand in terms of feasibility? I mean, obviously, there's a lot of resourcefulness that happens both before and afterwards in thinking up things, but things like um, staff capacity and logistics and uh, research opportunities or needs. I can see that um, a lot of you guys were being very creative in, in um, finding ways to staff and take the time out to do these things. Um, so just a general question for folks. Um, yeah, Mike, this is Ethan. And, you know, I think 
two things that the parks should perhaps consider as they as they embrace this kind of idea is what level, regardless of the investigation itself, which, as you just answered to, to Turk's point, you know, obviously needs um, uh, a qualified archaeologist, but also when working, and I don't know if y'all, the rest of y'all encountered this, but when, when your partners are doing a lot of the work, they don't always, even though they can be great partners, they don't always, um, you know, speak NPS. And, and that, that can be that can be good or bad, but in terms of like, um, I don't know. I think that the things that the Park Service does well, it's nice to have a, a daily presence. And and I found that the days that I wasn't with the students, I I I, I was, I don't know. I felt like when I came back, there was always a little something missing or something that I'm like, uh, you know, I don't know if we would have phrased it that way or would have gone that direction. And, and so that's not just a tricky balance, I guess, that anyone's going to have to negotiate when you're working with a partner. Um, and what that meant, though, was that it was tough for a park like ours, Richmond and Maggie Walker, which were relatively small. You know, we don't have a, a dedicated archaeologist, and we didn't, and we also did not have an existing, you know, funded project that they were working on. So what that meant is that there was just sometimes a disconnect, I felt like, between what what we were capturing like in the classroom or in research or especially when it came to interpretation guidance, um, whether I was in the room or a park person was in the room and when we weren't. So that's, that's something to just keep in mind. Um, I, I don't know what you can do with that information, but something to, something to recognize. And, and another major point is if you are going to do an excavation, um, I do think it would be handy, um, and again, something that we did not have, but I think it would have helped if we if we also had a funded project for for an actual archaeological investigation that rec that had follow up funding for um, the cost and especially the time necessary to do artifact cataloging and curation, um, because obviously these are really fast programs. You know, eight weeks in the middle of summer while the students are also doing other things, including a week long camping trip and all of these things, and, and you don't. You don't want to leave the park holding the bag uh, of artifacts, as it were. You know that can be that can be a bit of a, a drain. Um, and yet, I would hate to deprive the students of that opportunity to do the real uh, the real excavation component. And so, I just think if 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 in a perfect world you could also you know pair the pair this program with archaeology that's already permitted and already funded. Great. Anyone else agree? <laughs> this is Kate. I thought, yeah, those are definitely some great points. Um, and I, I agree with that. I would also sort of add that um, some, you know, some of these programs, uh, for us, one of the big um, the goals for us is sort of diversifying the field. And it's it's one of those important things to recognize that when you're talking very um, openly about diversity, about society, about um, about culture, and sort of like past oppressions, I think you you definitely have to be dialed into what those dialogues mean. That there's an emotional burden that goes with some of those. That it requires a lot of self reflection and acknowledgement. Um, about our society and, and how we address that and how we relate to others and a lot of allyship um, for some and um, sometimes like there there are definitely some people who who may be uncomfortable with some of those conversations um, and for me I'm I embrace those conversations and so for us that was always very successful um, but I you know I would encourage people to think about that um, depending on what type of program, um, you know, someone is interested in doing, that that those discussions are really important, and those discussions and how they resolve um, impact the way that the entire group functions for the for the entirety of the program, and and also how they think of um, a lot of us as NPS staff and how we interpret history, and if they can or cannot relate to what we're saying um, or feel heard. Um, that that is what hinges on the success of the program, in my opinion. Did it work? Great, fantastic. 
Any other comments? When I when I was going around to um, uh, meet and greet with the, the different teams across the country, I was always just really struck by the respectful atmosphere that was created, and I think that those um, those it, it, both among the teams, but even and how Park Service staff treated them and how the partners treated them and really just had these expectations that they would, that they had something to say and that they had something to contribute and that yeah, maybe they didn't know what what was up at that very moment, but they were perfectly capable of, of, um, of stepping up. And, um, right. and, and for all of these groups, um, there were some really tough, Conversations. These, these projects happened at some moments where, in in the nation's history, where some stuff was happening, and um, and the participants really needed to talk about it. And so, just having a safe space um, where they could create a group um, that felt like they could talk to each other that was sort of that was one of the interesting things about the Urban Archaeology Corps, I think, which is providing the space for people to feel safe where they could talk about stuff. Um, and talk about stuff in this environment that had been respectfully created because that was the expectation, that you would be respectful, that you would work to a high standard, and that you would contribute. And I think that was one of the really special things that everybody who created their project really um, made happen, and it was one of the most important things about it. Yeah, I agree. That's great. That kind of speaks to my experiences in public archaeology. Um, just because I think doing archaeology is a little bit of a weird thing to do. I mean, um, and it always seems to inspire a lot of fascinating peripheral conversations because it's not a, a conventional way of learning. Um, I've always had some really fantastic experiences at archaeology sites that I don't have anywhere else. And maybe some of that kind of physical, um, communal spirit um, inspire some of that that um, safe conversation. Great. Anybody else have uh, questions or comments or want to respond to some of those questions? Thank you. One quick uh, follow up to the question earlier um, about professional archaeologists and non professional archaeologists digging. My colleague Karen Mudar wants to add that an ARPA permit is necessary for excavations on federal land. Great. Unless Park Service staff is leading it. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. Yeah. Great. Well, let's wrap this up. Thank you so much, everybody. Uh, thank you for the great questions and comments and really uh, great insight um, in, uh, in the sort of complexities and rewards of doing the Urban Archaeology Corps programs. Thank you for all the participants, for your patience across uh, the expanse of the, the winter, <laughs> um, all the rescheduling and scheduling. I'm so glad to hear uh, from all of you um, and to have finally had this webinar. <laughs> um, thanks for everyone listening out there. Please tune in in two weeks, April 4th. Again, we'll have another webinar on disaster archaeology, Park Service response to hurricanes. Um, and we'll be, we've recorded this, and we'll be posting it on the Common Learning Portal in time. So thanks, everyone. Um, have a great evening. Thanks, Mike. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, all. Thanks. Goodbye. Goodbye.